Firing Line with William F. Buckley, Jr. Tonight's guest, Dr. Harold Taylor. Our topic, Academic Freedom and Berkeley. Here is Mr. Buckley. Uh, Dr. Harold Taylor, to everyone's surprise, was made president of Sarah Lawrence College, College at the age of 30. But he arrived uh, with impeccable credentials, having received degrees from the University of Toronto in history and philosophy, uh, in philosophy and literature, and a doctorate from the University of London, and having taught philosophy and aesthetics at the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Taylor stayed at Sarah Lawrence for 14 years, wowing all the girls with his charm and erudition, and the entire academic world by his prolific production of articles and books on all kinds of subjects. He, he resigned from Sarah Lawrence in 1959 to do independent research into the philosophy of education and other matters, and is currently engaged in superintending all kinds of committees, looking into all kinds of things, such as how to affect world peace, how to achieve universal brotherhood and other uh, objectives. Uh, Mr. Taylor is well known as a prominent one, even say, might even say undeviating uh, liberal. In academic theory, he subscribes to a more or less totalist view of academic freedom, the effect of which I sometimes infer from his writings, would be to make all students pretty much like Harold Taylor, which a lot of people, though not necessarily all, would believe to be a very good thing for world peace and universal brotherhood. Uh, let me begin by asking Dr. Taylor a concrete question. Would you, sir, as president of Sarah Lawrence, have agreed to appoint to your faculty uh, an academically well-qualified uh, racist? Well, I didn't uh, look around for faculty members in terms of their segregation policies. I think that a person who was a racist who had published in the field and argued that there was one race superior to another <clears throat> would probably be disqualified either by me or by the advisory committee on appointments from being a serious scholar. Um, so that it, it always came up in terms of who would be a first-rate teacher mm -hmm. and who had the qualifications in scholarship. Uh, th then uh, you, you, you would simply take the position that it is impossible simultaneously uh, to be academically well qualified and to believe in racism? Uh, well, uh, the arguments I've seen um, don't seem to me to uh, merit scientific scrutiny, mm -hmm. nor to uh, fit in with the sort of thing we were doing at Sarah Lawrence, um, as you suggested in what you yeah. said earlier, that uh, a liberal philosophy uh, ex exercises a point of view about education in which you try to sift the facts and take a look at what exists. Sure. Well, would you have taken the same position vis-a-vis, -vis, say, a communist? Would you say that nobody can be simultaneously a well-qualified scholar and a pro-communist? Well, a, a member of the Communist Party or one who subscribes to communist philosophy may very well be a good scholar. There are a number of them all around the world, and uh, they do have a point of view which they sustain by their own scholarship. Firing line is underway, and we'll continue in just a moment. Well, now, um, Dr. Taylor, in fact, we do know, don't we, that um, there are people who have advanced positions that some people regard as racist, uh, who, um, uh, whose academic credentials, at least uh, as far as any positivist examination of them is concerned, uh, sound pretty good. And uh, do I do? Did you do mention one? Carlton Coons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, is it possible, <laughs> uh, under the circumstances, <clears throat> that you really are making a, a valued judgment that you, are despising, <clears throat> a racism, let's say as much as I do, are prepared to uh, uh, assert that no one who is a racist actually would get into a college of which you were president, but that in fact people can be well qualified uh, uh, communists. Now, uh, what what? do you consult in making a decision of that kind, and how sure are you that you aren't in fact making a value judgment rather than a technical professional judgment? Well, I make, I make value judgments all the, kind, all, all the time, as, as you do, as everyone does. Mm. And uh, there is a sharp distinction be, to be made between a philosophy of racism, which uh, <coughs> confirms the notion that there is one race superior to another, and that the other races 
uh, to which one does not belong should be subservient, and a uh, political philosophy which one identifies as communism. I think you have to talk about those in two different well, if you're saying categories. Well, if you're saying A is different from B, I will agree with you to the extent that B is different from A. Yeah, well, that's but what I'm saying. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> yeah, but let's say a little more and, and ask whether or not there are analogous uh, uh, points that we need to make in deciding whether or not we're going to extend academic freedom uh, to cover person uh, A and person B. Now, I want to know why ought a person to be allowed to teach in a university if he has made a commitment as uh, a communist uh, to decide the truth on the basis of what he is told to believe by the party doesn't he, by that act, abandon that independence of judgment, which you judge to be necessary for a well-qualified scholar and conscientious scholar? Very good point, Mr. Buckley. Uh, but you have such a variety of points of view about communism and within the various kinds of communism in different parts of the world. There's a big row on in communist China about that fact itself right now. Uh, Gilles, for example, uh, holds views different from Tito. Uh, for which he suffered. Uh, there are varieties of socialism which are identified with what Marx said about one thing and others who uh, have a notion of a different organization under communism than Marx himself thought of. So that my judgment about a person worthy to teach is whether or not he's an honest scholar and produces evidence to sustain points of view which he believes in. Uh, the difference between a serious political philosopher who thinks the world should be organized in collective terms according to a socialist philosophy, and a racist is that the racist makes a judgment about the human race in terms of its color, usually, and uh, that settles the scientific questions for him. Well, it doesn't necessarily. You're talking about a very superficial scholar, uh, but uh, undoubtedly they do exist. In fact, we know that they do exist. Uh, people who, uh, for instance, in, in, in certain other ways, uh, find themselves highly commended throughout the academic community. Father de Chardin, for instance, uh, actually believe that there are certain uh, races uh, which are, are demonstrably uh, inferior. Uh, it's, it might almost be said uh, to have been true about Albert Schweitzer, who was nevertheless qualified as... Uh, as uh, he's a fellow uh, I wouldn't want on the faculty. Yeah. It's <clears throat> uh, not, you know... So, well, a lot of reasons. Yes, yes, I'm interested in hearing saying that, uh, yes, he was unhygienic, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I thought he was a kind of sloppy metaphysician. Uh, uh, his uh, medicine, I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Well, he wasn't, uh, uh, of course, he didn't pretend to be a metaphysician. He well, except a, in what he wrote, of course. No, <laughs> Which, well, he didn't write metaphysics. He wrote something else uh, in the field of philosophy. In, in any case, what I'm trying to get at is this. Uh, you do recognize, I understand, that there are no reasons to bar a man from a college, provided one can convince oneself, and I gather in your case the presumption is that, that uh, the presumption is always in his favor, uh, that that person honestly believes what he believes, provided he is technically qualified to teach. Well, uh, you know, uh, in terms of being president of a college where one's responsibility was to uh, make certain that the teachers who were appointed had integrity and honesty and a degree of scholarship commensurate with one's concerns for good teaching. <clears throat> uh, I, I didn't ever raise the question, you know, you don't ask a fellow who comes in and you're talking with him, uh, uh, are you a racist or, or, or would you show me your Communist Party card? Uh, the questions, as you put them, don't come up that way. Uh, you, you look for persons who, in their background and in their direct interests, wish to teach and have <clears throat> a concern for the life of the scholar, mm -hmm. and you decide with the help of your colleagues on who of all the people who could come you want to have. Well, let me give you an example that might have come to your attention. Uh, suppose uh, at Sarah Lawrence you had had a professor of international relations who was very much uh, in favor of uh, getting into the war in 1939 uh, and changed his mind suddenly and dramatically after the Soviet-Hitler uh, pact would you have considered calling him up to ask whether in fact he was motivated by his desire to follow the Communist Party line rather than as a result of independent research which suddenly and precipitately led him to contrary conclusions? No, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, this hasn't, you know, I, I didn't happen to have that problem, <clears throat> but if I had had it, that is not the way a college president solves the problem. 
Uh, I think a person who uh, professes political views and who shifted suddenly in the terms of the uh, Stalin-Hitler pact, uh, one would think that he was kind of unsteady in his total political judgment. But the president mm. doesn't call him up and say, come on in and explain your shift. Uh, the uh, faculty colleagueship, uh, the relation of the students, uh, the students are not people who just sit and listen to what teachers tell them. Mm. They form views of their own. And well, I think what sometimes. would probably yeah. happen. Some do, some don't. But uh, well, I'm asking. Excuse me, I'm, I'm answering your question sure. in terms of I my experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that the students I, and the colleagues in the faculty would um, invite mm -hmm. them to discuss such matters. And that would, in my uh, institution, um, when I was president of it, take care of the situation. There would be serious discussion of what was going on in the Hitler-Stalin pact and what was it meaning for the shift of opinion. Right. Well, now, if I may say so, you tend to answer my hypothetical questions by saying things don't work out that way. You're enough a philosopher to know that this is irrelevant when you ask a hypothetical question. Now, well, of course, the best mm -hmm. thing is to not to answer a hypothetical question, but change it to something that's real. Well, yeah. Sure. If you, if, you can say, if you say this is too theoretical for me even to consider, that's a form of an answer. All right, let me take something that I hope is not too hypothetical for you to consider, suppose. I was in uh, your college as a professor of international relations, and I came up to you one day and I said, Taylor Osher, I want to tell you something about me. I I'm a communist, you know. see. <laughs> yeah. I'm Please a communist. don't talk to me that way. <laughs> and, and, if, <laughs> and if the, uh, <clears throat> and, oh, I, I might say I've been instructed to do so by my party cell leader. See. And suppose I, suppose I said, uh, uh, I want you to know that I consider that the Communist Party is itself an agent of truth. Now, I'm a very bright guy. So don't try now to get all, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't try to pull your intellectual rank on me because I can show you, I, I, I can demonstrate to you uh, that the party is in fact the final uh, epistemological agent through which one knows how to forward the process. I would say, well, a funny way to talk. Right, you know? yeah, sure, sure. But, yes, and I think communists talk very funny. But, uh, but, and, and, the re and one of the reasons they allow to talk so funny is because nobody really uh, goes after them uh, enough. And but, uh, excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about a hypothetical situation. Sure. The one you created now is kind of funny in a caricature. That kind of thing is impossible to respond happen. to. Right. You know, um, in other words, you don't, you don't, well, suppose you suggest to me a way that I might phrase to you a question which will elicit from you a wrong the, answer. The, 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 no, no, the answer. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be the wrong answer, which is why I'm so dogged. <laughs> Uh, the answer to the question, uh, would you protect through academic freedom a communist of the conventional kind who understands himself to be obliged to follow the party line? But again, uh, I, I, I want to answer a serious question, which uh, I will now assume you're trying to ask me, although I haven't quite found the right way for you to ask me. Um, you need a few more degrees. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you do. <laughs> um, That's the, too quote way. <laughs> <clears throat> the way the problem of academic freedom comes up in relation to political ideologies of any kind, the communist thing um, is one of a whole variety of things one might profess and believe in. The way it comes up in a university, as I think you know, um, is a person goes about his scholarship, he usually publishes something which expresses to the world his own view in his own way. He teaches in his classes. <clears throat> he performs his duties as he sees fit to perform them in the community as a citizen. If he belongs to a secret party of one kind or another, uh, then this is his right as long as he is not uh, acting illegally. So that a college president or a dean, and let's remove it from Sarah Lawrence because this uh, problem as it comes up is a real problem in terms of the choice and um, uh, promotion of individual faculty members. The judgments are made for the most part by a faculty member's colleagues and uh, the dean <coughs> or the chairman of the department more often makes his judgments in terms of the quality of the publication rather than in the character of the teaching. Most deans and chairmen of department have very little knowledge of the quality of the person's teaching. So if an outrageous person who professed untruth publicly, both in his writing How do you and know before students. Truth? How do you know whether it's truth or not untruth? Um, 
Well, I, I'm assuming that one has some mode no, of judgment in reading. Academic and freedom doesn't permit you to judge something to be true or untrue, which isn't well, susceptible look, look, of scientific verification. I wonder verification. If, if I may finish the question, and then you can ask me about truth and all that. Mm. Um, the, uh, the publications of a serious scholar in the field of his own discipline, or in anything he cares to write about, are a public expression of whether or not he knows what he's talking about. The judgment of his faculty colleagues, and one would assume the chairman of his department and of the dean and the president, and assuming the president also reads, uh, are a factor in whether or not you feel he has something to contribute to the world of scholars. So the discipline, in terms of academic freedom, comes from one's colleagues more than from any other administrative apparatus. Yes, but having said that, it seems to me that you are precisely begging the point of whether or not a moral judgment becomes at any point relevant. You are watching William F. Buckley, Jr., host on Firing Line, guest Dr. Harold Taylor, mm. and we'll return in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I, f I find it uh, uh, difficult to uh, coax you into agreeing then in any, uh, uh, in, in agreeing with the necessity to make certain categorical statements about the disqualifications of, of people as a result of their affiliation with any particular movement. You simply won't go along with, say, the National Education Association, uh, the, the National Educational Policies Commission of the NEA that said that communists were not entitled to teach in free universities. Now, I never mm. thought that was a real issue. I mean, you appoint people to your faculty who are unlikely to come to you and say, here's my party card. Um, is that all right with you? You appoint persons in whom your own judgment uh, leads you to trust. And then uh, you judge them by the quality of their work as scholars and as teachers. So um, I just can't answer uh, the question in the way you put it. So I think in any case, that particular issue is not an important one. It's uh, very difficult to find a, a, a communist who has anything interesting to say even if you were you know, going out looking for communists to a point, which most college presidents don't actually do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's, uh, it, it puts the, uh, a more serious issue in a, in, a, in a situation in which it's almost impossible for a serious person to answer it. Well, it's interesting, I think, primarily as a way into a larger question, which we may as well now admit. Uh, namely, does a university, you will, I know, say no, uh, does the university well, why do you ask me? <laughs> because I want to hear you say it. You say it's a nice thing. Does a university have uh, the right to pass judgment on certain uh, moral systems and understand itself, at least broadly speaking, to pursue certain ideals? Uh, if so, <clears throat> then I understand that a university, for instance, would have been entitled in the early 30s to refuse to hire a Nazi a professor and would, uh, say, be entitled today to refuse to hire a communist professor. And I also recognize that there are dangers that the exercise of that power might end you up with too narrow uh, an orthodoxy. But would you admit the principle? Mr. Becky, we're right back in the same kind of question you asked me before. Uh, of course, a university has a responsibility both to the young and to the society of which it's a part to make certain that the persons who come to teach the young have integrity, have scholarship, have the ability to work with ideas in a sensible and rational way. Now, that's where the issue is. And the choice... No, it isn't. I mean, I think that's precisely not the issue. I think Eichmann had integrity. But he wouldn't teach in my university. But you, you're so windy <laughs> no. about why, why, how I would get Eichmann out of your university, it's almost hard well, to find out how actually one would go about doing it. But you it. see, uh, again, you, you keep creating unreal situations in which Eichmann uh, would be an applicant for a faculty in uh, the United States or anywhere else. But you do, you do acknowledge that there were pro-Nazi professors uh, in Germany between 1933 and 1946. Well, surely. Right, and, now, and the Germans... Now, would uh, there have been a violation of academic freedom to have booted them out? Uh, I'm saying that you've got a different system in the German university than you have. You weren't saying that, <laughs> but go ahead. Well, I didn't get a chance to. No. Uh, thank you, and I now have my chance. The, uh, the German system in the universities in the 1930s was one controlled by the political apparatus of the German government. They deliberately appointed 
pro-Nazi professors in order to profess a doctrine approved by the government. Now, Mr. Buckley, the difference between the German philosophy and Nazism and the American democratic philosophy, I may point out to you, is that we deliberately exclude the government control of our universities for a very good reason, that we don't want political ideologies officially adopted by any government uh, to be used as the basis for a philosophy distributed to students in the modes in which teachers would with their doctrines if they were appointed to do that. So that, uh, that's why I say the, the question itself um, isn't put in a way that it can be sensibly answered. You have a way of reaching for empirical difficulties so that you can't so that you don't have to give honest theoretical answers to vexing questions. Well, ask me a good honest right. question so, and I'll answer all it. All right, here's a good honest question. All right, let's admit that there were Nazi professors who were placed in universities in Nazi Germany, which we all know is the case, but there were also some who became Nazis uh, of their own free will, who had gotten tenure, who had nothing or whatever to, officially to do with the state. And I'm asking you, would you have fired them if it had been your power to do so? You're talking about the German universities, Mr. Buckley. Uh, okay. uh, I'm yeah. talking about the American. <laughs> I would not have been in a German university in a position where I could do this. So I think that's a kind of silly theoretical question, if I may say so. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Taylor, do, do you admit that the constituency of a private college ought to uh, include uh, the alumni? That is to say, uh, ought the alumni to have a voice in setting the standards and the objectives of a particular college? Uh, not really. I think the business of the university is with the scholars and the students. And the alumni, who are those who, if one has been successful in educating them, will understand the purpose of the university as being the continuing uh, winnowing and sifting of the truths and passing them around to the students who are there. I'm glad you didn't say that was, was a silly question because you're not an alumnus. <laughs> uh, uh, then, uh, if, if this is the case, uh, are the alumni entitled to say that uh, winnowing and sifting truths has the effect from time to time of identifying certain things as untrue and that therefore those untrue things ought to be not taught? The alumni are persons who have the same rights as any other citizen. Whatever their access to the public media or to the ear of the president or of, to the students or the community of scholars in the university should be open to them as to everyone else. And it's crucial that those graduates of the college who um, have gone on to other pursuits should retain intellectual and social and cultural interests. Therefore, a president, a dean, a faculty, a university should welcome comment from them just as from everyone else. But there's no special virtue in their comment except those virtues engendered by the quality of education they've received. They have no official right to intervene in the uh, policies of a university as these are developed going along. Says you, not say I. No, no, I'm yeah. sure you would disagree, yeah, right. but you asked me the question. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, but you, in other words, you, you, you don't think they ought to have that right. Uh, in point of fact, for instance, Yale University has uh, six out of, I think, 14 trustees who are directly, uh, uh, who are directly elected by uh, the alumni. Uh, and uh, these, these gentlemen understand themselves to be there representing uh, the alumni. But although it, it's perfectly easy to read to them, as you just did to me, a list of their constitutional rights, this is different from saying, do they have the right, for instance, to argue that somebody, a professor who teaches uh, uh, the wisdom of uh, uh, adultery uh, ought to be There you dismissed. go again. Yeah. Now, my, my point is, uh, sure, there I go again. And that's why I'm here. Uh, the, the, the point uh, surely is that some people believe that those alumni have a right to exercise an influence on the corporate direction and meaning of education, whereas there are others who believe that their only function is, is in effect to uh, breed students and raise money. Well, I, I'd really like to give you as serious an answer as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the relationship of the graduates of a college to the institution from which they graduated should be personal, direct, and a kind of uh, mutually concerned relationship. 
I think the, uh, in, on the whole, the alumni who represent officially the alumni body on the Yale Corporation are persons <coughs> of independent judgment, and they don't feel that they have to crowd a professor and come in and report, get him out of there. As I recall, you used to think that uh, when you were an undergraduate, and I still gather do, you yeah. still do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the problem is to make a community of educated persons who share together in their wish to make a better university uh, than it was before. I contend, and I think with uh, uh, some evidence to support the contention, that unless the alumnus or alumna comes to the university in a spirit of help, not saying, I wanted to get that faculty member out of here because I disagree with his views. You might think that was helpful. Oh, sure. Um, but I, I, what I'm arguing is that we don't put him in an official relationship in which he has the power to remove from his post a member of the faculty with whom he disagrees. Uh, the big uh, protest movement by students and faculty members against boards of trustees who are uh, doctrinaire and authoritarian in their attitude to the mind and to faculty members and students is that the community of scholars working with students have the ultimate responsibility for a decision about what's taught and how it's going. And they can listen to everybody, not just alumni. I think wise college presidents and deans and students and faculty members should listen to um, the entire world in terms of what is being said about the quality of education being done in their own institution. Yes, but you distinguish surely between listening William Buckley's and guest tonight on Firing Line is Dr. Harold Taylor. They'll return in just a moment. It seems to me that uh, teachers have a role that goes beyond merely uh, a search for new ways, as you put it, of sifting truths and, and the rest of it. They are a, a part of a community. And that uh, when it isn't generally recognized that they have some responsibility to assert the standards of that community. You get the kind of breakdowns that you get in Berkeley. Now there, uh, a professor who finally had to flee Berkeley because his nervous system wouldn't stand it anymore has recently uh, written, and he's, he's a liberal and a moderate in all things. Uh, when teachers <coughs> abandon their responsibilities, they become false teachers and sow confusion in their students' lives. Freedom of speech, freedom of debate have never been at a lower estate in any major American university in the last generation than Berkeley. Now this moderate liberal fellow, Louis, a few L L Louis Foyer, mm. uh, well, and he chose to go to the University of Toronto, uh, having um, had a serious and concerned uh, series of experiences in Berkeley. Uh, he has called the present situation there a low ebb. <coughs> Uh, there are many who would say that uh, one of the most interesting and important things that have happened in American education is the protest of the students against an archaic and obsolete system of education. It certainly is interesting. <laughs> yeah. The French Revolution was interesting, too. <laughs> well, uh, and it, I must remind you, Mr. Buckley, that the French Revolution... Uh, you heard. Uh, yeah, I'm glad it happened. <laughs> I see, well, yeah. 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 Uh, the, uh, I, 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 and most people do seem to agree on, on this, uh, namely that uh, our education at Berkeley has become uh, a very difficult process for some people to, uh, to get. Uh, difficult because uh, the, the, the campus is pretty much in the hands of uh, rebellious students who seem to have uh, deserted all normal criteria of order, civility, decency, uh, chivalry even. Have you been out there lately, Mr. Buckley? No, I wouldn't go out there until I took a refresher course in the infantry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you, you're probably no. well advised. No, and I, I certainly wouldn't go out there. Even, even when uh, Arthur Goldberg went out there, he said he would never go back there again uh, uh, because people won't listen to him. Uh, uh, but Bundy they went in out complete there. silence. But Bundy went out there, and he, he, they wouldn't let him speak. This was the idea of free speech by these particular uh, uh, hooligans. Uh, and it seems to me that, that nobody who, who values uh, privacy or the processes of, of, of civility will go there any more than it's likely that for a while McNamara is going to go back to Harvard uh, after his experience there. Oh, uh, well, you're, you're suggesting no one is going to go anywhere, then, if they can't even go to Harvard, you mean? Oh, I, I'm citing Harvard as, uh, as a university which fortunately had the good grace uh, within 48 hours after the episode to pass around uh, 
uh, an apology signed by something like 95% of the students to Mr. McNamara. I think that was an unfortunate experience for Mr. McNamara, and uh, uh, it was appropriate that he receive an apology. But Mr. Goldberg's visit to Berkeley was a completely different character. He was listened to, there was order, and they didn't agree with him, but they didn't disrupt his opportunity to speak. Uh, Mr. Taylor, do you find it undisrupting if you're trying to listen to the ambassador of the United Nations speak, to have people with uh, placards in front of you, waving them up and down, saying doctor of war, uh, and then simply filing out continuously. Even your powers of concentration might not be able to withstand that kind of distraction. There was uh, a great deal of difficulty, and there is a great deal of difficulty in conducting uh, the affairs of the university. Uh, but it's more important to deal with the question of why these particular difficulties have emerged, and not simply to say it's a lot of hooligans doing it. There have been uh, incidents uh, going back beyond 1964 when the major protest was made. I agree. Uh, but the thrust of the student movement, as exemplified in Berkeley, was not uh, the thrust of hooligans who simply wanted to disrupt university life. It was a serious protest by serious young people who insisted that their rights to organize political affairs be granted to them and that the education they were being given be improved. That's what started the row, and the incidents of 1964 uh, were an important episode in the maturing of a whole student movement. Uh, Dr. Taylor, you can always find uh, causes that would justify complaints. What you need to ask yourself is whether whatever it is that needs doing at Berkeley, and I'm sure there are things that need doing at Sarah Lawrence and Harvard and Yale and anywhere else, are things that best get done by allowing a bearded uh, fanatic uh, to get up and, uh, uh, and, and play half-time president, occasionally uh, alternating with the chancellor and giving release time to students to, to go to class. I, I don't recognize uh, in, in You don't recognize Mario Savio? Uh, well, well in, in, in point of fact, he did do this. In point of fact, students moved in and sat in on the administration building, defying, uh, among other things, the laws. Uh, and 300 or 400 or 500 of them were carted off to jail or whatever it was. 800. Uh, 800, thanks. Uh, and uh, <laughs> also... Uh, also, when, the, when an attempt was made to arrest, the whole processes of law and order broke down because 800 or was it 1,000 students surrounded an automobile. Well, you, you recognize so, the yeah. term civil disobedience. Yes, I see. Which is did. part of the American tradition. In other words, when uh, a policeman goes out to arrest someone for clearly violating the law, uh, you believe that this is a moment for civil disobedience, that he ought not be... Depending on the circumstances. And the yes. circumstances were, as far as you were concerned, tolerable. Intolerable for the students. The actions they took, I think, were the direct result of the conditions they found themselves in. It was in. intolerable that the administration should say uh, that you can't have, uh, you can't broadcast uh, for your particular organization with a big loudspeaker more often than once a week per organization. That was intolerable. Oh, excuse me, are we talking about 1964, 65, 66? Well, or the, 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 the last ride was over that particular one. Well, now, uh, may I say exactly mm -hmm. what that was about? Uh, the uh, regulations controlling the use of public assembly and a loudspeaker were quite explicit and were laid down with uh, a kind of joint concern for getting uh, audiences together at one audience at another time from another. And there were violations of the use of those uh, facilities by the students. The, the row that resulted this past uh, uh, semester came because the threat was made, and whether it was a just threat or whether it should have been received by the students is irrelevant at the moment, that these ground rules had to be observed, otherwise the whole um, apparatus would be moved to another part of the campus. Yes. That's what the students were objecting to, that uh, to threaten to move it then was going to mean that uh, they would not have access to public discourse. That's right. And then, then they wanted to call a strike of the entire school, and then they, they wanted to call it again when the chancellor refused to negotiate with Mario Savio on the grounds that he wasn't a student. The point is, uh, it has become uh, chaotic. Three times as many uh, faculty members as normal uh, have, have, have quit. Uh, it, uh, it is impossible for Nathan Glazer, for instance, he reports, to teach a class on sociology. If a student gets up and says, I want you to denounce the Vietnam War, uh, the um, point is, it's, it's, it's become Berkeley. one of those South, South American-type universities 
uh, and it's going to suffer, and it's going to suffer in my judgment because enough people don't recognize the responsibility of faculty to maintain standards. Mr. Buckley, I think um, uh, you have distorted the exact episode we're talking about. You've read Mr. Foyer's article, and there have been incidents of the kind which he describes there. I've read lots but of articles. Surely. Yeah. And um, I'm glad you have, since it uh, <laughs> indicates an interest in a serious situation, which in a sense is symbolic of a fundamental discontent on the part of an awful lot of students, not only with their education, but with the social system in which it is a part. And I would urge you to understand the Berkeley episode in terms of a a discontent with a lot more things than just the administrative rules in that situation. Well, I, but I think that's uh, I'd like to get us off these... Uh, sure. I think that's a jejune observation. I was very much discontent, so were a lot of my friends, with various aspects of Yale University. We didn't think that we were privileged under the circumstances to occupy the president's office and give him lectures about the tradition of civil disobedience well, in that's, America. That's because Yale is Yale. Um, it is uh, a gentleman's college where they don't do such ungentlemanly things. Uh, no, th that, that's not the point. The point is that I don't do those ungentlemanly things, you see. And, and you, ought to, you ought to say, well, now, that's, that's, that's highly commendable under the circumstances. Uh, well, I, could give, I could share with you something of the intellectual patrimony by which I came to be as I am. Well, I would like to take this to uh, a more serious point, um, although I enjoy the rhetoric. Um, and the issue is, uh, if we may use Berkeley as an example, one can use other instances. There you had certain kinds of confrontation in which uh, the most recent have not been the most uh, fruitful or the most attractive. But even this last episode, which had many confused elements in it, which were not as clear cut as the 1964 protest, that's why I, I'd like us to distinguish between the two. Even this last episode, Due to the attention of the faculty, that since the uh, Muscatine report and the other efforts on the part of the faculty to do something about the situation of the students, since this last episode, a faculty commission has now been appointed to deal with the total question of what the rights of students are in relation to making educational policy. And they're apparently so disgusted that they only show, only about 5% of them never show up. Uh, this is typical of faculty members in terms of making but, educational but it, policy at large. They don't be, go to faculty It used to be 30 or 40 percent, according to at least these set of figures that I saw. The faculty members themselves are simply getting disgusted by the nature, uh, uh, by the nature in which certain students are insisting that progress be made. Uh, you do understand, and uh, I'm sure we'll agree, Dr. Taylor, that an awful lot of people are opportunizing on these general discontents for their own narrow ideological purposes, Maoists and the rest of them who say that the revolution is bigger than all of us and that Berkeley simply ought to be considered as sort of a logistical base uh, for the uh, revolutionary Mr. movement. Mr. Buckley, you should know, and you probably do, that the Maoists, uh, those uh, who have a political ideology which they're urging, are a variety of kinds and are, are a minority in the situation in Berkeley. There is a fundamental human problem in Berkeley. Yes. You have what has been really an obsolete system in which uh, Mr. Kerr uh, described the way in which it was obsolete, referred to the student situation in Berkeley and in the big University of America as one which was against the interest of the intellectual growth of students <coughs> and the phrase, uh, the campuses are full of the walking wounded, was yeah. Mr. Kerr's phrase, yes. an accurate one. Now, the student unrest is a protest against the inadequacy of their education and the kind of political controls established against students which are not established against citizens who don't happen to be students. And the issues are very clearly drawn in Berkeley, uh, which are more confused elsewhere. And the issues there really are, what are the rights of a student in making policy about his own education? Uh, when one looks at the situation there from that point of view, uh, if a political opportunist Wish to, wishes to join in the general protest, this is his privilege too, just as it's the right of a conservative student to join in the protest. No, but uh, uh, when you say right, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. What I am asking is, in fact, what has been the result of the introduction into what might once have been uh, a perfectly decent movement with decent ambitions and uh, with uh, a gentleman's agreement about methods by which progress is made. What has been the result? 
of the introduction into that situation of people who desire convulsion for the sake of convulsion, and what are we to say about the opacity of those professors who allow themselves to be led around by the nose by people like Bettina Aptheka? Now, uh, the point of the matter but is <laughs> that a lot of professors have made asses of themselves. Uh, that a lot well, of it depends Macaulay, which ones uh, you mean. Well, so, well for instance, which Herbert, ones, Ma Herbert uh, McCloskey was on your side a year ago, and he's grown up. And he, uh, he's been there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you put it so gracefully, he, Mr. Buckley. Yeah. Well, you, you asked if, if I had been there, therefore that becomes relevant. Herbert McCloskey teaches there. Mm -hmm. uh, and he has said that the whole thing is a, a bloody mess. Uh, uh, Professor Tussman's whole glorious idea of this floating university uh, has founded. And people have recognized that one of the reasons why uh, the situation got out of hand is because people talk as you do, insisting the students have all these, quote, rights. They don't have those rights at all. They have the rights to go to the university or not go to the university with reference to the kind of university that is constructed there by its faculty and administration. Well, uh, to it our may watching be a firing line to with you. host William F. Buckley, Jr., his guest tonight, Dr. Harold Taylor. We'll continue with questions and answers in just a moment. It's time now for questions and answers prepared by the staff of Firing Line. They have not been seen either by Mr. Buckley or by Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, I'd like to refer this first question to your attention, please, sir. From your experience as a college president, can you tell us what you would do about the 2,500 non-students who've done so much to politicalize student activity at Berkeley? Well, again, I'd have to know uh, what particular situation I was asked to deal with them in. The non-student population in Berkeley is, in my judgment, a interesting and serious community of uh, persons who just don't happen to be enrolled <laughs> at a given moment in the university itself. Uh, in turn, if I were the chancellor, if I were Roger Hines, I would not think of them as a regular constituency uh, with which I should negotiate in that uh, if you've got uh, enough problems with a regularly constituted student association, uh, I think those are the people you should deal with. Uh, on the other hand, I think it would be terribly important for people to realize that uh, those who are called non-students in Berkeley um, are in many cases people who uh, haven't got enough money to continue on a consecutive basis the attendance at the university. Others who've come into the community the way um, Americans used to go to Paris in the 1920s to get out of the provincialism of their own community into one that is uh, more interesting. Uh, it, it's a lively, serious, and, and uh, exciting intellectual community which they make. And I think they make a real contribution to the university, although in this present uh, period of the university's history, um, there are um, more political problems which they produce than would exist if they weren't there. Do but I understand you correctly then to say that you would ignore them, sir? I, I, I didn't think I said anything like that. Uh, I said I wouldn't uh, consider them a properly constituted body with which to negotiate, but that doesn't mean I would ignore them. Uh, many of them <clears throat> are people who are simply out of school for a given semester. And uh, very intelligent, interesting people, some of them writing poetry, novels, painting, sculpting, uh, making a lively and exciting community. And I don't think you ignore that. You, uh, I think you're lucky if you've got as interesting a community around you as the uh, university in Berkeley has, no matter what kind of trouble it makes for you. Mr. Buckley, what would you comment to that on? Well, I, th I think if I were chancellor of the University of, of Berkeley, I would discourage its becoming a sort of a revolutionary mecca because um, that simply is, is highly distracting, I think, uh, strategically. And under the circumstances, uh, I think I would uh, encourage uh, a, a division uh, between the student body uh, and uh, the particular camp followers who seem primarily to be attracted uh, to the Berkeley community because of a permissiveness which is now catching up with the university itself. Mr. Buckley, uh, conservatives have talked a lot about the rights of the non-political students at Berkeley to pursue their academic careers unmolested. What comment do you have on the recent poll in which 90% of the students at Berkeley express satisfaction with the education they're getting? Well, I, I, I don't know about the poll, but I would judge it to be highly irrational uh, if they were to do anything else, because after all, the fact that they're there presupposes that they choose to be there. 
anybody who can get to, into Berkeley can get into almost any other college in the country. So uh, I, I would find it very surprised to have people who are studying in Berkeley and saying that there's every reason for them not to be studying in Berkeley. At the same time, I'm interested in that poll because it seems to make me less uncomfortable than it would Mr. Taylor, who is talking about how this deep dissatisfaction uh, in Berkeley uh, is the cause of the various uh, uh, carnages and things that we have going on out there. Dr. Taylor, are you uncomfortable with the results of that poll? <laughs> no, I think it's... Uh, I have two responses. One is that it, uh, in most student bodies, uh, when there is dissent and protest and general intellectual and political excitement, it is by a minority of the student body. And if 90% of the students polled said they were enjoying life at Berkeley and thought the education was fine, uh, this means that they may not have penetrated to the insight necessary to understand what was happening to them. Uh, that is typical. I, I would say that the entire civil rights movement on the American college campus is carried on by a 5 to 10 percent minority of, of the younger generation. And uh, the great service they are doing to the country is in raising the moral and social issues uh, to a degree of public visibility where there can be some effect in changing the situation against which this minority protests. So I think the 90 percent owe a debt of gratitude to the 10 percent who are raising the issues. There is now more attention paid by the faculty at the University of California in Berkeley than in any previous uh, four, five, or six years. There are now serious concerns about educational policy being raised by the faculty administration. And they would not have been raised had the protests not been invoked. I don't think you'll agree with that, will you, Mr. Buckley? Well, I think there's serious attention to reviving capital punishment, as far as that goes. Uh, the, 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 I, too, would be seriously concerned uh, if I thought that uh, uh, next morning I might not be able to occupy my office without stepping over three great big bodies. <laughs> but, uh, it was, it was certainly concern me. I uh, quite understand. We'll continue with Firing Line in just a moment. Dr. Taylor, on behalf of the staff of Firing Line, may I thank you for your very informative contribution to tonight's discussion, Academic Freedom and Berkeley. Our, of course, our host tonight, as usual, is William F. Buckley, Jr., the name of the program, Firing Line, our guest, Dr. Harold Taylor. Good evening. Good evening.